Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to this episode of the DJP. As always, I am your benevolent host, Justin Otto. On this episode, my guest is Deborah Eaton Tull. Uh, Deborah is a Dharma teacher and the author of three books, The Natural Kitchen, Relational Mindfulness, and Luminous Darkness, which just came out not that long ago. Deborah spent seven and a half years as a monastic and left the monastery to reintegrate into lay life and the householder life and and bring these teachings into the world and she's doing an excellent job of that if you'd like to find out more information on her you can check out deborahedentoll.com and uh, she's actually going to be teaching a retreat in bay st louis in october for flowering lotus meditation if you're interested in that you can find out more information at floweringlotus.org also in july there is a compassion meditation retreat also hosted by Flowering Lotus Meditation. Uh, It's actually a partnership between Flowering Lotus Meditation and Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, two entities that are both very near and dear to my heart. And I'll be at both of those retreats, so if you wanna come, it would be cool, and we can hang out and in silence, and that'll be fun, right? Uh, So check that out, floweringlotusmeditation.org and uh, deborahedentoll.com and uh, wildheartmeditationcenter.org uh, and uh, I guess that's it so uh, you know without further ado we'll get into the episode uh, Deborah Eaton Toll you might catch yourself sliding in and out of you might catch yourself sliding in and out of a hallucinatory state do just relax and enjoy it just relax and enjoy it this is an experiment this is an experiment in mind formation, in mind formation. In formation, forming, 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 controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your and mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble, scramble confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. Deborah Eden Tull, how are you? I'm well. Happy to be here with you. It's Friday and it's my day off. And so it's a great time to just drop into conversation and see where we go. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, days off are always nice. I feel like I don't get enough of those. You know, it's it feels like we need to really um, schedule them in and have conscious protection just because there's so many demands and needs and because there's that phenomenon of loving what we do and loving teaching and service, right? right. So sometimes we forget. <laughs> and yeah. we, we can get really wrapped up. I know I, know I do. You know, I, uh... Days completely off are needed. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, well, it's lovely that you have one of those to take. And you said you're in uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina? Yeah, Black Mountain, North Carolina, about 20 minutes from Asheville. It's a small town. And we moved here from California about five years ago mm-hmm. and just felt really inspired and called by the the deep green of this place, um, the presence of the water element in so many forms and just kind of small town small town at a time when i think um there's this acceleration going on uh, in so many places and this acceleration to the sort of technology-based world and a busyness that uh well it fits into our mention of days off for those of us who really recognize the need for restoration and balance and to model that for everyone we're teaching, this is a good place to be. Yeah. 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 So the self-care aspect is so important and just saying, you know, today I'm just taking care of me and I'm not doing anything else. And I'm going to go do all the things that I want to do or do nothing. Uh, Yeah. I took one of those days the other day and went, uh, took myself to the beach, went by myself and had a had a lovely time and just got into nature and just kind of reconnected, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love that. And one of the, the themes, I think, for many of us right now is just making sure we get time 
plenty of time with the more than human world and recognize that there's a lot of challenge going on in the human world right now in our collective. And so time to really let uh, ourselves be restored by the elements. Yeah. That's so well Just, put. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said you said you moved to North Carolina from California. Where were you at in California? We were living in Ojai, California, which is a really sweet spot uh, near Santa Barbara, a couple hours from Los Angeles, where I have family. And it's a place that actually somewhat similar to Black Mountain is is known for contemplation for retreat. Uh, Krishna Murdy settled there. Joan Halifax settled there and started the Ojai Foundation years ago. The Theosophists, so many different traditions. And it's an incredible land and community, though it's changed dramatically uh, during the pandemic, but was a place that I um, always visited growing up and found refuge in the spaciousness and also a place that I led retreats for many years. So I had a a really uh, nourishing time living there, but also the experience, the felt experience in my animal body of climate change, um, not seeing the community kind of rally in the way of drought tolerant living that really excited me. (laughs) Um, And just recognizing the challenges of living in California on so many levels, especially for someone who was a monastic for many years. Um, It's been really a gift to move and settle out here. Let's talk about your time as a monastic. How long were you a uh, monastic? It was like seven, seven and a half years, right? You got it. Seven and a half years. I moved to the monastery when I was 26 and just felt a really deep conviction. I felt the same uh, level that I feel today of uh, a sadness, a, a being sobered by what's going on in our world and human consciousness and a deep inspired call to simply uh, drop down into distilled practice and the power, the potency of that. And I want to emphasize for listeners as much as my time at the monastery was phenomenal. What I teach now is not monastic training, but that we, our practice is living exactly where we are in the context and circumstances life has given each and every one of us in our relationships, in our social engagement, this is the domain in which we awaken. (laughs) And so there used to be kind of more of a sense, oh, people need to go go away to caves and monasteries for the contemplative aspect of practice. But I find there is so much uh, growth and evidence in today's world about just practicing wholeheartedly where we are and the collective aspect, waking up together through our relations and our collective challenges so yeah but you could ask me anything about the monastery time that feels uh intriguing <laughs> what what led you to to take up robes what led you to to embrace the monastic lifestyle you know i am someone who's always been deeply passionate and on the path and really um clear on purpose since I was very young. And I think in addition to having parents who were very clear about purpose and intention, they were both uh, social activists and artists and um, lived, modeled for me a very courageous life and how they engaged in the world When I was 11, I lost my dad, who I was incredibly close to, who I talk about in my recent book as my first spiritual teacher. Um, And I lost him very unexpectedly to cancer. He got one of those uh, pieces of news that everyone's psyche dreads, sort of out of the blue. You have one month left to live. And... It just simply informed me at a really young age that uh, we don't have time to waste here and also that everything is impermanent and also that watching his model of um, dying a graceful death 
as tragic as that entire time and that piece of news was, he had a contemplative practice of his own and was deeply embodied in it. It made a huge difference. Um, and so that all inspired me. And then I think as I continued to open my eyes wider and wider to what was happening in our world, environmentally, socially, just witnessing the poly crises of our times, I, I knew that I wanted to immerse in a place beyond the human mind for answers, <laughs> um, beyond the paradigm, the dominant paradigm for answers, and something about the simplicity. Um, I love simplicity. <laughs> the simplicity of monastic training really called to me, and it also took courage. You know, I was 26. It was a really outside the box thing to do and anyone listening knows whenever you make a deeper commitment to practice there's simply a a real letting go of control <laughs> control is an illusion but many of us hold on to it tightly and there's an absolute letting go of it when you for instance step in to work intensely um as a monk or take any deeper step in practice of surrender yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I definitely agree with that. That's amazing. Yeah, I that's uh, I'm so sorry to hear that you lost your father at such an early age. I my my father passed when I was 20. So, uh mm. I I, mm. I definitely understand and uh he had uh, suffered a massive uh massive heart attack when I was uh 13. And uh mm. And, uh, so he, we, he had about, I got about seven years with him after that, but, uh, it was the heart attack was actually surrounding, um, my own cancer diagnosis. Uh, when I was 13, mm -hmm. I was, uh, diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia and wow. yeah. So I got the, uh, the, we don't have time and <laughs> the impermanence message pretty early in life myself. <laughs> Yes, yes. And the the reminder, um, the message that this human experience, yes, on one side, it contains more love than we can ever imagine, and more pain and vulnerability, uh, fragility than we can imagine. So we need the badass tools that practice gives us, right, for resiliency, for loving fully in the time we're here seen clearly so thank you for sharing that yeah yeah my heart is with you yeah. so yeah that's a big decision to make at 26 to just i'm moving to the monastery and i'm this is what i'm doing now yeah that's that's i, I can't imagine even myself at 26 years old making that decision you know a lot of love went into it, but also a lot of suffering went into it. A lot of like looking, looking around at the the world I was seeing and the um, seeing clearly the internal conditioning, the pressures, the really I would call it self hatred that I carried then, and I consider self hatred anything other than true self compassion. Um, Every relationship we will ever have uh, is an extension of our relationship with, with the self. And I recognize that I really um, was struggling. Uh, so it was both a personal choice and also a choice on behalf of the collective. I knew, I've always known, I'm here to serve. I'm here to be of service. And just felt so overwhelmed by um, what I saw in the world. And also, you know, I have a family that I feel really grateful for, people who've always made outside-the-box decisions, um, like people who have really taken a stand for the cause that they're working for, people who have chosen uh, to be outside-the-box thinkers. And so that's always given me courage to make fresh choices, right? Some people might want to commit deeper to spiritual practice or do something radical in that way, but feel too much pressure from the conditioned expectation. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. And something, yeah. something you said actually kind of resonated with me. You said, you know, the, the, every relationship that we have is an extension of the relationship that we have with ourself. And really, I mean, all we have is 
relations relationships right so you know we you got have it relationship to self our relationship to the perceived other our relationship to uh everything the the earth itself and i think you've touched on that in some of your work yes yes that consciousness is this living field of relationship of non-separation with all dimensions of life and so again we're not using the word relationship in the sense of subject object um, separate self but the invitation of practice which is to experience and live in and then make all of our choices from the reality of interconnection moment by moment and yeah thank you for bringing in the piece about the earth because it is it is one of the most important shifts that we need to make today is helping people drop a sort of anthropocentrism that can come in practice even and that's very big in the dominant paradigm and also learning to resource ourselves deeply each day this goes back to you going to the ocean on your day off and <laughs> learning to resource by the earth as we face all that we're facing so you've written a few books now you i know you wrote your first book was uh the natural kitchen correct well after i left high school i grew up in la and as soon as i graduated i moved across country and kind of committed to daily meditation at the same time as i learned to be an organic gardener and farmer and sure we had had small gardens growing up i had hippie parents but really learning the art of sustainable regenerative agriculture and it just felt it felt important to me personally it felt like a offering of healing um in terms of the overconsumptive paradigm i had witnessed in la the disconnect from the earth that i knew i was part of um a movement of helping people to heal and there was such overlap for me in the discipline of showing up complete beginner's mind humility not um imposing ideas onto the earth but an earth steward learns just as in practice to show up open and empty and to receive guidance moment by moment and to deeply listen so my path became very much about this weaving of deep embodied listening within deep embodied listening to the land i was working on deep embodied listening in all relationships and i think of meditation as really learning to listen to life as it unfolds moment by moment so that is to say <laughs> i worked on a number of um, organic farms including green gulch farm the san francisco zen centers farm before becoming a monastic and then started the gardens at the monastery where i trained and when i left it was just this beautiful opportunity to both teach dharma i mean i was <laughs> back in la of all places which was such a wild and unique transition but also someone gifted um some land in their backyard for a community garden of sorts and i started a community of people who wanted to learn and let all kinds of gardening and also permaculture workshops back then and so someone came to one of the workshops i was leading workshops about all aspects of sustainable living and kind of sustainable living as an inquiry i do not see it as separate in any way shape or form from dharma practice but a aspect of dharma practice that we can strengthen because it's so joyful and so life affirming and someone came to one of those workshops who happened to um be a publisher and they had a great self-reliance series of books they were doing and so they asked me to write that book and it was really really fun a really fun project and also <laughs> maybe i knew i was going to be writing books and i've always loved writing but it was kind of the first okay let's roll up my sleeves and find out what this actually requires which is a lot <laughs> to put any book out there yeah. yeah that's what i've heard that's what i've heard that it's a tremendous undertaking to uh 
to sit down and actually do the work and and write. You know, I've I've, I've interviewed several authors uh, on this podcast and you know, I've got friends that are in the process of writing books now and and everyone is just like, yeah, it's it's more work than I I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also an art to writing a book in a way that really offers a teaching. Like I use in every book inquiry and include practices and really want people to be able to bring whatever's being shared into their actual direct experience. Um, so that's been fun with each book project. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So you, you, you like I said, you, your first book was The Natural Kitchen, and then your second book was Relational Mindfulness, which is a topic that I am – just so deeply involved with i i as we, you know we, we've already talked about everything is just relationship and and so what what was the the impetus behind that one like sure i had no choice about writing that one um, <laughs> relational mindfulness a handbook for deepening our connection with ourselves each other our planet it was so clear to me number one the moment of moving from silent monastery in the wilderness to the megatropolis of Los Angeles of all places, um, having to wake up super early just to have a little bit of silence, of pure quiet, socializing, being with family again, um, working in more social fields, dating again, like it was so dynamic. And I recognize the potency and power of my practice and of everything that we learned simply in sitting meditation. Uh, I translated this into nine principles that we can bring into every single relationship. And the first time I taught my, my Los Angeles Sangha, um, I remember guiding sitting meditation and then guiding a relational practice, a listening practice, and pe people just being in tears recognizing the need, the unmet need they have for really genuine listening, genuine relating um, that they weren't often getting in more scripted or sometimes superficial or just conversations where people were distracted. And it just made me recognize, okay, this is really important for people. And I will share that since writing that book and really meditating deeply on what are each of these principles and for instance intention acknowledging that the power of intention is everything in how we show up and oftentimes the ego carries these side intentions in relationship or agendas we could say like i want to get your approval i want to look good i want to be liked I want to be right and have you be wrong. And these completely distract us from the heart's intention, which is shared presence, waking up together to a depth, um, interconnection that we all crave and that we know. Another principle is transparency, speaking in the moment truth. Mm. Another principle is turning toward rather than away. So all of the sort of triggers or difficulties or even just awkward moments that can arise um it's a beautiful beautiful set of practices and in the time since that book has come out i've gotten to see that work applied everywhere from couples and families and sanghas and organizations to even corporations who have taken that in uh, to create a more relational uh, genuinely relational culture. And I just love the work so much. And the more things get very bumpy and divisive in our larger world, uh, the more I recognize the power of these practices. <laughs> so this year, we're going to be putting on the first relational mindfulness facilitator training. We have people from all over the world who have been practicing this. And it's just an incredibly powerful and simple um practices to live by yeah. yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful and yeah you know to be honest that's a that's an area that i i still struggle with is my relationship to self and and that that bleeds over into as you said as we said earlier into into every other relationship uh yeah i don't know if you know dave smith but uh yes and yeah. i love dave smith 
Go yeah. on. Yeah, I love Dave. He's such a great dude. Uh, but we were having a conversation. I was on retreat with him uh, earlier this year uh, over over the New Year's in uh, Joshua Tree. And I was having a particularly rough patch in my relationship. And uh, he said, well, you know, we treat every we treat the people closest to us the way we treat ourselves. And that was just such a profound thing for me to hear in that moment. And uh, it really shed some light on, on my relationship, m- mostly with my my uh, partner. Uh, we're mm-hmm. actually we're actually taking a, a bit of a break right now uh, because I, I identified that I still have some work that I need to do before I can really be in a healthy relationship with, with yeah yeah with somebody you know and yeah the intention I think that's really do, honest go on yeah the intention is to you know to do the work and to to hopefully come back together and 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 be in a healthier relationship but it it took a lot of a lot of self inquiry and a lot of honesty with myself to even come to that point where it's like, look, I I have work I need to do. And this relationship will, will not last if I don't. Yeah. Again, I think that's really radically honest um, and really generous of you. And I'll just share, we don't have it going right now. There's just so much else on my Dharma plate, but for a long time, we we've had a relational mindfulness, uh, sort of sangha for people who are in committed partnerships because Mm. everyone needs support and everyone needs inspiration from others who are really applying relational mindfulness to our committed partnerships. Um, There's not a lot of great modeling out there. Um, And so that was a really fun aspect of our sangha. And I'll let you know, we started up again, (laughs) but there's some great, um, courses, DIY courses, even on my my website about relational mindfulness and about uh, committed relationships. Yeah. 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 Thank you for, thank you for all the work that you've done on this, in this area. It's, it's, it's such a needed thing. It's so needed. It's such a needed thing. And I, I do feel that for too long, there's been kind of an assumption of a divide between what we're doing on the cushion And then our relationships, or even what we're doing in Sangha, and then our relationship with the rest of the world. And in the Sangha I guide, we our intention is always to see the entire world as our Sangha, uh, to recognize that there's a choice we have in every moment for how we show up. And there's an incredibly freeing place beyond the projections we're often unaware of that we're putting onto people, Mm -hmm. the expectations, you know, when we're not anchored in our self, coming from center, taking deep and continual care of this being, we can show up with so many unmet needs and unconscious needs to the relational field, and and it gets messy. (laughs) And one more thing I'll say right now, from that quote that you shared in your conversation with Dave Smith, it also reminded me of a quote that um, I've always appreciated from Thomas Hubel, who's sort of more of a non-dual meditation teacher. Mm -hmm. And he says, don't treat the people that you see every day as if they were yesterday's newspaper. And it kind of reminds us to just stay awake, stay curious to every single conversation and engagement we're having. When my husband and I first got married, Joanna Macy, who's one of my... um, core mentors said, you know, make sure in your vows to include a vow about practicing seeing one another as the mystery throughout your entire relationship. Again, so we're not pegging like, I expect you to be the same you you were yesterday, or you to be in the same mood you were in earlier today, or you to be some fixed identity rather than the continually evolving emerging being that you are right that makes life so much more uh alive and exciting yeah that's, yeah. that's so beautiful yeah and, you know because we're, we're you know we're, we are constantly changing constantly evolving and to have the expectation of of you know especially an intimate partner being the same version of themselves that we we met initially is yeah. just such a disservice to to each other really yeah, and to practice. Practice invites us to really soften that sense of or e- even interest, attachment, like fixed identity, and really become 
interested and nourished uh, by emergence and all that is unfolding and the felt palpable experience of life yeah unfolding so that's much more dynamic than i see you that you may be even seeing a friend and i'm seeing you as you were last time i saw you instead of fresh in this moment right yeah, yeah. i love that i love that you use the word curiosity you know just just remaining curious about about the people that we interact with every day it's it's such a core foundation of practice and a relational practice just curiosity and i think it's funny because sometimes there still is like a unconscious assumption you know that the expert is where wisdom is the expert is what we're trying to get to or kind of an upholding of attainment of knowledge expertise and i just love i mean i come from zen but i find so much depth in beginner's mind uh, the archetype of the fool the kind of childlike wonder that is all built on curiosity <laughs> that's the place we want to live our practice from yeah yeah and i i, tr I definitely try to do that <laughs> as much as possible but you know mm -hmm. it's always it's always that you know all we do is forget right <laughs> Come back to Senate, right it's just forgetting and remembering forgetting and remembering i mean yeah, that's that's the practice isn't it <laughs> yes yes <laughs> So let's talk about your your newest book, Luminous Darkness. I I haven't read it, but uh, I think our our mutual acquaintance uh, Beth Herzig has uh, has told me a little bit about it. But could you, you know, fill us in a little bit on on your new book? Great, yes. Um, this book, this is the one that took the most uh, courage to write. This is the book that I feel like has been actually brewing my whole life. Uh, I feel that darkness has perhaps been my greatest teacher. And I've become aware over time that there are so many dimensions to the duality of dark versus light. Dominant paradigm tends to hold light as higher, superior, everything we're going for in spiritual practice is light, right? right? Let me get to the light. And in all of that, that has us embrace a kind of approach of pushing away the dark, spiritual bypassing when we don't even know we're doing it, assuming our shadows and that aspect of the dark are negative and to get away from when in reality, they are the greatest source of power. When we turn towards and embrace our shadows, the dark, uh, our dislike of the dark has led to racism and xenophobia to a degree that none of us can fathom. It's mind blowing what's happening right now in those domains. Darkness and our dislike of it has led to the overlighting of planet Earth. And this is actually a major uh, ecological crisis right now. And there's so much more I could say about the divide that we've created, this hierarchical perception. Mm -hmm. Everything we're looking for is light, right? And so that means pushing away the dark. Maybe not. Maybe what we're going for, maybe what we're here for is wholeness, a radical wholeness, a quality of presence that is the Dharma, what the Dharma is teaching, that invites us to embrace completely the light and the dark, and even to ultimately dissolve that duality so we can recognize that in nature and consciousness the full spectrum of light and dark is life and i don't want to get too philosophical right now i'll just say <laughs> that um it was really interesting for me because um you know i'm someone who while my core practice is zen buddhism i've been deeply informed by um many wisdom traditions throughout my life my one of the gifts of my dad as a spiritual teacher was when i was a kid he read to me from everyone from the buddha to krishnamurti to lao tzu to traditions from faraway continents that um, i wouldn't have come across to christianity and judaism and there are so many traditions that have celebrated darkness as an instigator of spiritual growth. 
and darkness as a doorway to expanding our consciousness. So for me, there was this kind of fascination with darkness and also this fascination with the degree to which um, the culture I grew up in was steeped in what I call sunshining. Let's try to keep it light, everyone, right. which is only. about <laughs> good vibes only, um, <laughs> which again is just not honoring of wholeness and yeah. our authentic power. It takes away so much from our authentic power. So when I was um, actually, I was leading a retreat with Dave Smith at Land of Medicine Buddha some years back. And then just after that, leading a retreat at Esalen in Big Sur. Mm -hmm. And I had a kind of a mystical experience under the night sky at midnight, one of the nights, of course, amidst deep meditation, in which I received a crystal clear calling and spiritual instruction to write this book. And the experience put me in kind of a a wild cocoon of transmission for a few weeks where I was in very much an altered state. And I remember having some resistance to the project, like, oh, come on, darkness, that's such a big topic, <laughs> really. And and then just surrendering, saying yes. I remember at first some pushback, pushback from publishers like, how about if darkness is in the subtitle, not the main title? <laughs> and finally, when I showed them, here's the proposal, here's where I'm going um, with this, you know, they fell in love with it as much as, as I was in love with it. And the first section of the book is how I fell in love with darkness. Um, and it was just interesting that then the pandemic hit right at that time that I had just signed the contract and writing about darkness personally, collectively, um, during the pandemic felt so deeply synchronistic. And it was incredibly healing for me. And it also affirmed, okay, our collective is ready for this message. And we really need support with how to meet the mystery, the unknown with love, how to soften and release our fear of the dark how to turn to the teachings of darkness. So it was a great project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm I'm going to, to order it as soon as we get done speaking, actually, is <laughs> after everything you've said, I'm, I'm just so interested in it. And, you know, I, I've, I'm a, a big, uh, uh, Carl Jung fan, you know, I've, I've mm -hmm. loved the works of Carl Jung and he has that lovely quote, the, you know, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Yes, making the darkness conscious. I've got that quote in chapter one. He <laughs> says it well. <laughs> and we're, we're so supportive in our practice, so supported by cultivating and remembering the courage, the generosity, the equanimity, the curiosity to turn towards all that we've labeled dark. When we label things dark, um, we turn to kind of, we tend to kind of go to sleep. I'm just pushing this aside mm. as in an unwanted place or putting it in a dungeon of isolation, this dark emotion I wish I didn't have. Mm. And it's truly in making it conscious, uh, bringing it into the light that a, an alchemy occurs. So, Thanks for bringing up Carl Jung. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to me to bring up Carl Jung. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I bring him up in almost every conversation I have. <laughs> well, he's got a lot of medicine when it comes to relational mindfulness and relationships. So that makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 So as far as like retreats are concerned, well, you seem to teach a lot of retreats. I've checked your schedule out and you, you seem pretty busy. What, what do you what do you love about the retreat process? Sure, yeah. First, I'll say that um, I teach both in person, we're back to residential retreats again, and sometimes at home, uh, Zoom retreats. And I think one of the best compliments I continually receive is that being on Zoom with me and with my Sangha feels nothing like being on Zoom. <laughs> and I think that has to do with the, the quality of how 
relational mindfulness gets transmitted, uh, relational presence. Some of the retreats that I guide are silent and some are more social. So where we're actually not in a container of silence, but actually um, practicing relational mindfulness throughout both our group times and the in-between time, also with plenty of space for solo reflection and quiet. But I really love the the both and. Um, there are retreats where I guide. I, I always bring in some relational practice because, again, we're honing our capacity to listen deeply within and to listen to the earth, to listen to one another in ways that we can easily bring back home into ordinary, everyday life. We use and practice everyday life as a laboratory for awakening. Um, this changes the whole game of life. I'll also say that um, earth-based practice, deepening our connection with the earth, is part of every retreat I ever guide. I bring a very um, dynamic toolbox to guiding retreat. So while sometimes it's sitting meditation and relational practice or rituals in the earth. Sometimes we do sitting meditation and we also practice dance and conscious movement because I believe a lot of people create a disconnect between being in their bodies and embodiment and practice have to go together. <laughs> so I, I think I love retreat so much because transmission the transmission that happens when we're together, again, in person or online with shared intention, uh, resting in being together. It's immeasurable. It really is. And I am so lucky in this role I'm in to get to see lives transformed <laughs> continually. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you, you you said this. Um, this I can't remember exactly the way you worded it, but we, that we bring the experience of the retreat and what we we have we've gotten from the retreat back into our lives when we leave the retreat, and it kind of goes back to something you were talking about earlier um, when you were talking about your your leaving the 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 monastic life and coming back to Los Angeles, and for for me, I, you know, I've never been a monastic, but I, I've sat plenty of retreats and. For me, the real practice is the lay the lay life, right? You know, that's mm -hmm. where the, the practice really takes off is because there's so much to work with. Yes. You know, on one level, there's so much to work with in both domains. <laughs> sure. Um and um certainly a whole new dimension open to my practice when I became a lay practitioner and teacher. But I really when I hear people say, Oh, you know, I can't go as deep as others can because I'm so busy and I'm a parent and I can't make it to the retreats I wish I could or I don't have the resources. I really like to encourage people to just drop that story because, again, exactly where we are, exactly the circumstances, all of them that we've been given, this is our portal to awaken through. Um, our karma is our dharma, <laughs> we might say. <laughs> so, um and yeah, it's really important, really supportive to to have sangha in some form to when we can uh, go on retreat. But I think there's a lot more awareness in today's world that life is practice and that practice happens everywhere. I think even 10 years ago, there was a stronger divide um, between ret retreat or what happens on the cushion and this life. So that's an exciting unfolding. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you what do you have coming up uh coming up soon? What if people would love you know, if people would like to sit a retreat with you or they would like to get involved with you in some way and, and your work, how how can uh how can people go about doing that? Sure. Thanks for asking, Justin. The Fierce Compassion Sangha meets every Tuesday, nine AM Pacific time, twelve Eastern time. And it's a beautiful community. The um nonprofit I run, Mindful Living Revolution. There's people all over who are embodying practice in badass ways. And it's, we just have a really fun sangha. So I'll put that out there. And in June here in North Carolina, we have right now just I think three spots left, but 
There's a silent retreat called Return to Source at Southern Dharma, and we will also be engaging in the work that reconnects, which, again, one of my teachers, Joanna Macy, created this beautiful field of work that's been with me since I was 20 for transforming our pain for our world into love and compassionate action. And I have, after that, a woman's retreat coming up in the summer about deep time, slowing down as a path to authentic power, and a retreat in Mississippi with Flowering Lotus based on relational mindfulness about Kalyana Mita, cultivating spiritual friendship. Mm -hmm. And I also have all kinds of things online. There's a summer training and sacred activism that will be four weeks with Nina Simons, dear friend and co-founder of Bioneers. And um, one of my longer trainings that is really one of the loves of my life is a six-month training called The Heart of Listening. And it's um, for people who really want to go much deeper in their own awakening and their own embodiment of deep listening. It's a training that often facilitators and leaders take part in because it's also to inform and guide people in being better facilitators and and leaders. Um, so it's taking the relational mindfulness teachings a lot, lot deeper. And, you know, there's always more that I'm offering. Uh, people can visit my website and see what lights you up what interests you yeah i think that's all i'll speak to for now <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today i, I really appreciate it. it's been a lovely conversation and i, I look forward to uh to seeing you at uh in mississippi in october S same thank you so much for helping to organize that justin and i really appreciate this time to talk with you today so thank you and thank you to everyone listening much appreciation. Thanks again to Deborah Eden Tull for taking the time to be on the show. And again, if you'd like any more information about her, that can be found at DebraEdenTull.com. Again, uh, she will be teaching a retreat in October in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And if you're interested in that, you can find more information about that at FloweringLotusMeditation.org. Thank you for listening. Uh, the best way that you can give back to the show is by rating, reviewing, and subscribing, and just telling a friend. So if you did enjoy it, and I hope you did. Uh, please remember to do those things. As always, this has been the DJP. I'm Justin. Peace and love.